Good afternoon, Gus. Talking about distribution of elements, you've got a page here that shows two pie graphs. I am not going to expect you to memorize all of this information on these two pie graphs. What I want you to gather out of these two charts is that oxygen is the number one element in both the Earth's sea crust. I'm sorry, there's no sea crust. Excuse me, I'm thinking of a pie crust. The Earth's crust, seawater, and air, and in human bodies. Oxygen's number one in both of those. So if I ask you, what are you mainly made up of? You are mainly made up of oxygen. In fact, you can write chon, and that's what you are mainly made up of with oxygen being your number one element. So it's oxygen first, then carbon, as you can see, then hydrogen, and then nitrogen. So you are mainly oxygen, then carbon, hydrogen, and nitrogen. Now, does this mean that I can make a baby by taking, a hundred, I can make a 100-pound baby, ha-ha, by taking 65 pounds of oxygen, 18 pounds of carbon, 10 pounds, you, you get my point. No, I can't do that. I cannot do that. We can't make life. Only God can do that, in my opinion. But we can't do that. This is your main composition, but it's not in an ele you're not a mixture of elements. You're a mixture of elements and compounds and mixtures of mixtures. You are a huge, beautiful, beautiful piece of matter. And you know that you do matter. So just remember though, you are number one oxygen. Now let's go back though. So the earth, the seawater and the air also are mainly oxygen. Where is all that oxygen? Is it all in the air? No. Where is it? in the water. We are mainly made up of water. That's where all of our oxygen is. And that is where all of this oxygen is. It's in the water. Most of the water, or I'm sorry, all of water is mainly oxygen by mass. And so if you wonder where all this oxygen is, it's tied up in water. Now, another interesting thing for my ag majors and soil science people is the silicon. Uh, over a quarter of the Earth's crust, seawater, and air is silicon. Where is that? Yes, you're right. It's the sand. You, you have a lot of silicon in the soil, and that's because of the sand. Now, different soils are different, but silicon is one of the main ingredients of sand. And then you have some metals, lots of metals, actually. Aluminum, that's a large percentage of aluminum. That's a lot of aluminum. Iron, as well, go back. What do we use to build things with? What, what do we go back in history? Iron Age, Bronze Age, that's our copper, which you're not even seeing that on this chart. So it's not even something that's 1% or more. And so when you look at what do we use a lot of? Aluminum and iron. Do we build with those? Yes. Why? How can we? Because we have so much of it. Does that mean that we shouldn't worry about recycling? Not at all. We should be concerned about recycling because we don't want to have to dig up more ore when we could simply recycle what we've already dug up instead of throwing it away. So I'm a big believer in recycling. We eventually, could you theoretically use up all the iron and aluminum in the earth? And the answer is yes. But before that happens, I think what we would do is become better recyclers. I may be wrong, but I believe I won't be here when we have to worry about that. So what do I want you to get out of here? Number one element in your body is oxygen and the others are carbon and hydrogen. All right, let's talk about diatomic elements. I'm using the notes that already have the answers just to save a little time with this video because I've also given you access to these notes. So I'm just pretty much talking about it. This is not my favorite way to lecture, but in the interest of time, this is what we are doing today. What are your diatomic elements? Your diatomic elements are elements that cannot exist alone in nature. I'm getting out a periodic table for you. I want to show you where these are on the periodic table. They actually make a seven on the periodic table. So grab your periodic table, 
And note, I'm going to highlight them for you. Starting with nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine. Look, what is that? That's a seven. And what is it pointing to? The seventh one. And who is the seventh one? Hydrogen. So over here is hydrogen. So those are your seven diatomic elements. I remember them not because they make a seven. I remember them because of the acronym Hofbrinkle. Hydrogen, oxygen, fluorine, bromine, iodine, nitrogen, and chlorine. That is why or how I remember the seven diatomic elements. But let's go back and talk about what are they. They do not exist alone in nature. They must be in the diatomic state or combined with other elements in a compound. There are seven of them. There are seven diatomic elements. And as I just said, they make a seven on the periodic table with hydrogen being over there. And so what you're actually seeing is it is... Um, Nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine. Those are your seven diatomic elements. What's special about them? They can't be a movie or a TV show that deals with medicine, and they don't say give them some O. They say give them some O2. Why do they call it O2? Because it's O2. They must be combined in a diatomic state, which is what this is talking about, or they will be in a compound. Now, you can have these in a compound, and they are not going to be diatomic. If you have hydrogen, for instance, alone, it's this molecule. This is diatomic hydrogen. That's what it is. That's diatomic hydrogen, H2. This is a single bond. We're going to talk about this a lot later, but for right now, you can see this is a single bond. This is hydrogen H2. Water, the structure for water, is this. These are lone pairs of electrons. This is a bond. This is the structure for water, which is H2O. Is this hydrogen diatomic here? And why is it oxygen diatomic, you might ask? Because this is not diatomic hydrogen. Notice, who is that? So these seven elements are either in a compound, bonded to something else, even if it's another diatomic element, or they are bonded to themselves as diatomic molecules. So these are sometimes called diatomic molecules, diatomic elements, but they are molecules because they are two nonmetals bonded together. And when we have nonmetals bonded together, we call them molecules, which gets us to our next little drawing here, our little flow chart. So let's talk about compounds for a minute. Now this is not, these are not compounds. This is not a compound. This is a compound. This is a compound. This is a diatomic molecule. This is not a compound because there's only one type of element in it, and that's H, hydrogen. This is a compound because it's two different elements. So there's a difference. So what is a compound? We've already talked about this a little bit. A compound is a chemically, are chemically combined elements. And this is not my lecture on nomenclature. If you are in 106 lab, you already are hearing my lectures over nomenclature. So that is your full lecture over nomenclature. Right now, I'm not teaching nomenclature. I'm giving you a quick overview of nomenclature. The first element indicates the type of compound. If the first element is a metal, then it will be an ionic compound. If it is a nonmetal, 
then it's a molecular compound. If I can stress to you anything that is important in understanding nomenclature, it's that right there. If you have a metal first, and I'm going to give you an exception to it's a metal or ammonium or hydronium, If you have a nonmetal, it will be molecular. So let's talk about the two different types of compounds. Compounds are chemically combined elements. Now, big picture, let's go back for just a moment. Let's go back to the big picture for just to remind you what I'm doing here. There was another shorter video that had matter, and then we classified matter as to substances or mixtures. We further classified substances as to elements and compounds. We talked about mixtures and how to separate mixtures. Now we're breaking down elements, which we just did a little bit by talking about what elements are found in nature and in humans. We talked about the diatomic elements. And what are we now talking about further? We're talking about compounds. So I could take this right here and expand it to this flow chart. So that's kind of the big picture. Wanted to touch base, make sure you got that. All right, so what are compounds? Compounds are chemically combined elements, and we have two different types, molecular and ionic. The smallest particle of a molecular compound is called the molecule. Hence, what did I call these? I called these the diatomic molecules because this is the smallest particle of those elements, and that would be a diatomic. elements. I'm sorry, I should have said this. They are stable as diatomic. That's why they exist this way. They are unstable as monatomic. That means single. They cannot stay alone. That's why, because they're unstable when they're alone. They're unstable when they're alone. All right, sorry about that. Let's go back to molecular. So molecular is smallest particle is called a molecule. They're made up of all nonmetals. We do not have ions in molecular compounds. There are no charges. We share electrons and we use prefixes. If you're working on your nomenclature for lab, let's think. Look for the nonmetal. No charges. Don't worry about balancing. Use prefixes. That's my little quick notes for nomenclature. Ionic compounds, the smallest particle is called a formula unit. The first element is usually a metal, but it is always going to be a cation because that's what they're made up of. And it's a metal except where do those charges come from? The cations and the anions. The charges are due to a transfer of electrons and you do not use prefixes. So ionic you're looking for a metal or hydronium or ammonium. You will balance the charges, no prefixes. That's for nomenclature. So our cations and our anions, let's deal with those for a minute. Cations have a positive charge. Anions are negative. Cations are metals and ammonium and hydronium ions, which we're going to talk about. And anions will have a negative charge and they are made up of nonmetals or polyatomic ions. Anions and the charges must be balanced. So all I'm wanting you to learn from this chart today, I'm giving you this for future reference, but for our exam the first exam, what I want you to realize on this is that you should be able to identify the type of compound. And how you can do that is look for a metal. If you look for a metal, it's ionic. If it's made up of nonmetals, it's molecular. That's what I want you to know. Otherwise, this is good information for lab and for nomenclature. But for right now, for the exam one, nonmetals, molecular compounds, metals, ionic compounds. First element, that's what you're looking for, and that'll tell you. All right, it's also important for us to learn how to read compounds and read equations. So let's look at 
compounds and equations. I'm going to start off first with just that simple compound of water over here. I've written water. All I want you to do right now is tell me about atoms. It's two atoms of hydrogen and one atom of oxygen. That's what that means. So the subscripts, which is what this lower little two is, the subscripts indicate number of atoms. And if there is not a subscript, it means one. So we are learning to read a compound formula. That's what that means. Two atoms of hydrogen with one atom of oxygen. Now then, if we react compounds together or compounds and elements, we have to write a chemical equation and we will have a chemical reaction. So a chemical equation is an expression of a chemical reaction. This is a balanced chemical equation. We have reactants on the left and we have products on the right. The left side produces the right side. In other words, reactants yield products. This arrow means yield. That's what that means. This is just a shorter way to write that. So in this scenario, we're saying two sodium atoms. Notice how I'm saying this, and I'll tell you right now. Two atoms are reacting with two atoms of chlorine, except that they're not in the atom state. They're in a diatomic molecule state. Why? Because chlorine is a diatomic molecule to produce two formula units of sodium chloride. What in the world are you talking about, Ms. Brooks? Why are you calling Sodium is an element. Chlorine is also an element, but it's a diatomic element. So it's a diatomic element or a diatomic molecule, and this is an ionic compound. And what's the smallest particle of an ionic compound called a formula unit? So who are the reactants? Two atoms of sodium and one molecule of chlorine. That's what no number in front means one, so that's one, why am I calling it a molecule? Because it's diatomic. But what does that one molecule of chlorine have? Two atoms of chlorine. So two atoms of sodium and two atoms of chlorine are on the left side. What are the products? Well, it's only one product, and it is two formula units of sodium chloride. That's where that two NaCl, and I told you that, two formula units of sodium chloride. What is the sodium chloride made up of, though? Each formula unit has one sodium atom and one chlorine atom. So when we have two formula units, that means we have a total of two atoms of sodium and two atoms of chlorine. So whatever the coefficient is, which is what this big number is called, big number is called coefficient, the big number is multiplied by the number of atoms of each element in the compound. So since there are no subscripts, that means two NAs and two CLs. So now, does our equation balance? Yes, two atoms of sodium and two atoms of chlorine. We produce two atoms of sodium and two atoms of chlorine. Short overview, we'll practice that more, but really think about looking at equations and seeing if you can determine the number of atoms on each side learn how to read compounds, and I'm going to do just a couple more right now for you. Let's do one called barium phosphate. Actually, I'm just going to do one more for you. Barium phosphate. So I'm going to real quickly just go off on a limb here for 106 lab students. Barium has a charge of plus two. Phosphate is negative three. I know my ions, and so I know my formulas as well. Barium is BA. Phosphate is PO4. That's how phosphate writes its name, is PO4. To balance these charges, 
I'm going to need three bariums and I'm going to need two phosphates. Why is that? Because three times positive two is plus six. Three times plus two is plus six. Two times negative three is negative six. So this is a balanced formula. This is a balanced formula. Now on our test one, you're not gonna have to do this. I'm just helping you out for 106 lab. All right, what you may have to do though is tell me how many atoms of barium are there? Three atoms of barium. Of P and two times four, which is eight atoms of oxygen. So if I'm breaking down barium phosphate, like we broke down water up here and like we've broken apart this equation, this is what I get. What's the difference between mass and weight? We use these terms interchangeably in lab, but they're not the same. Mass is the amount of matter in an object. It is constant with regard to location. It does not change with location. Weight, however, is a measure of the Earth's gravitational attraction for an object, and it does change with location. If I want a quick weight loss, if I want a quick weight loss, what am I going to do? You got it. Go to the moon. Why? Because you don't have the Earth pulling on you as much. But am I, are my pants going to fit in more loosely? The answer is no, because what am I not changing? I'm not changing the amount of mass. So what I really want to say is I need to lose mass. And in losing mass, while I am still on Earth, am I going to lose weight? And the answer is yes. But mass is what we really are saying when we want to lose weight. We're really saying we want to lose mass because that's the amount of stuff, the amount of matter in the object. So again, they're different. Keep that in mind when you are reading. Realize that there is a difference between mass and weight, but also realize that in lab, oftentimes we will use these interchangeably. Thank you. Have a great day.